numbers. That is so, yes. Yep. <laughs> so A is countable, so A is countable uh, means that there exists a map, right? There exists a map uh, A going from the natural numbers to to A, and this map is uh, A is on to, right? A is one to one and on to. In other words, it's the same thing as saying that there exists a sequence, right? Right. Remember what a sequence is. A sequence is just a map from 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 n into some other set, right? So it's the same thing as saying that there exists a sequence, um, right? That is uh, um, a one-to-one -one onto sequence, right? There exists a one-to-one -one onto sequence, one-to-one uh, -one onto sequence. Into, into A. Right. So, yeah. Okay. Um, and what we, uh, the theorem that we finished up with last time was this one that said that um, every infinite subset, every infinite subset of a countable set is itself <coughs> countable. Okay. And you know, basically, what we're doing here is um, no, no, that's not what we finished up with. We finished up with um, the theorem that said that um, a countable union, right? A countable union, a countable union of countable sets is still countable. Right? A countable union of countable sets is countable. And you remember how we did it, right? We, we lined up everything and then we made this sort of snaky, snaky path here, right? And we said, okay, well that, that defines a sequence, right? That defines, you know, that snaky path gives us a sequence that is, um, that covers the union, right? That was an onto, that was an onto sequence, right? Now it wasn't an into sequence. Right? But if you throw out, if you throw out some of the, if you throw out any repeating terms, then it is an into, then it then it is a one to one and, and onto onto map from from the set to some subset of the natural numbers. Right. So you get some you get some you, we got some map from um, uh, from the, the the complete union to some subset of the natural numbers. Right. And then we observed that that, um, that that set had to be infinite, right? And so was was countable. So that's that's roughly the, the, the line of the argument. So today we're going to finish up um, with a couple of sort of uh, you know common facts uh, that are that that you, you should know as as people interested in mathematics. Okay. So um, yeah. Okay. So. Okay, so the next thing we're gonna do, um, yeah. So uh, that is what we're gonna show are, are two things. One, that uh, the rational numbers are countable, and we'll also show that the real numbers are uncountable. Okay. So you know, these aren't these aren't things that that we use very often. Um, well, I guess we use them occasionally, but. Um, you know, they are sort of things that every every everybody interested in mathematics should know. Okay, so um, okay, so the next theorem is the following: Suppose you have a countable set, a, a countable set, and let b sub n denote the set of n tuples. So um, a one, a two, through a n. Where the where the AI are all elements of A. Okay. This is the set the set of n tuples. Okay. Of A. N tuples of A. Okay. So this is this is something you've seen before, right? This is just like the Cartesian Cartesian product. Right? If you have R, you have R cross R. 
right? This is you know, R, R, N. Right? This B, B sub N is basically like R to the N. Right? It's just multiple, it's just vectors of, you know, you know N, N vectors where each of the entries lies in, lies in A, right? You, you, I think it's probably, um, we'll leave it as B, B, N, but I think it would make more sense to call it A super N, right? In other words, A cross A cross A, N, N times. Um, okay, so uh, if you have anything like this, then uh, then B sub n is countable. Okay. So that's what we're going to prove. Um, let's just start off with. Uh, Consider B sub 2. Okay, B sub 2. Well, B sub 2 is going to be everything that looks like A1, A2, where the A, AIs are in A. Okay. Okay. Well, um, <coughs> right, we can write B sub 2. B sub 2 as a set is the same thing as the union of everything that looks like um, uh, I don't know, so um, uh, A being countable means that A can be written as x1, x2, Da, 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 right? A can be put into a non-repeating list. Right. And <clears throat> observe that if you take, um, if you consider the set um, x i uh, cross a. So consider everything that looks like this, um, x i a, where a ranges in a. So consider consider some, the sets that look like this. Okay. Right. So right, the first the first entry is is x of i, and the second entry is allowed to be anything anything in a. Right, so the first entry is fixed, and the second entry is allowed to range over A. Okay. Well, this is, um, you know, we can make an, we can see that this is, uh, this, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between this and A, right? Right, because you know, just, just map onto the second, second term, that gives you this map from here to here, right? Okay. And you say, well, okay, um, what's B2 then? Well, B2 is just the union of these sets, right? X i comma a, where the i ranges from one to infinity, right? Where a can be a can be anything, right? All of B two looks like this, right? B two is going to be, you know, somebody in a, um, right? You can you can break you can break uh, B two into these into these subsets, right, into these disjoint subsets, right, right, is, is that okay, everybody all right with that, okay, right, and so what do you see, well, this is, this is a countable union, and each of these things is countable, right, so you've got a countable union of countable sets, and so B2 is countable, so by the previous, by the previous theorem, B2 is countable. Well, you know, and then if you wanted to go to B three, you know, you just do this. You just do the same thing, right? Um, you do the same thing, uh, but instead of instead of A here, you would use um, you would use B two, right? So you just add on one more. You're just adding on one more uh, one more entry, and you'd use the same argument, and that would show that B three is B three is countable, and so on and so forth. Okay. So this is really you know an induct. 
the proper way to do it is by, by induction. Yeah, Sorry, so you're saying for B3, instead of little A being in A, you have an element that's in B2? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I guess, um, you'd say, okay, uh, where, um, where uh, A of X is M comma N, right? Where A of X is M comma N, where um, X equals M over N in lowest terms. Right. So that's a that's a well-defined map from from Q into into B two, right? And so you know that you've got uh, you've got um, this map uh, into the countable set, right? So um, uh, B two being countable and um, Right, and Q is infinite. Right, and so um, you would have um, a one-to-one -one correspondence with uh, between Q and a and a subset of this countable set. Right, and so um, you'd have a one-to-one -one correspondence with an infinite set of a countable set, and so that's going to be countable. So um, Q is Q is complex. Does M have to be necessarily different than N in this case? Yes, because I'm I'm assuming it's in lowest Both. terms. So you're not it's not gonna be they can't be the same, then it'd be one. Is that all right? Anybody have questions? Okay. okay. So Q turns out to be um, uh, uh, a countably infinite set, right? You can um, you can make a one-to-one -one correspondence between Q and um, uh, and the natural numbers. So um, okay. So the last thing we're going to show about countability is this thing that says that um, uh, the set of all infinite sequences um, whose elements are zero or one right, is uncountable. Okay, and this is the famous, uh, the proof is called Cantor's Diagonal Process, or Cantor's Diagonal Argument. Okay. Okay. So you're taking sequences, right? You're taking infinite sequences, um, You're taking infinite sequences, um, a1, a2, a3. Right? So your set, your set looks like a1, a2, a3, blah blah blah. It's an infinite vector now, um, not a fi not a finite vector, but an infinite vector. Okay, and each of the ai's is either zero or one. Okay, so that's that's our set. Right, our set. Um, we just said you know if it's if it's finite, well then it's it's you know, it's, it's, it's going to be, yeah, it's at most countable. Um, <clears throat> okay. But what happens if you have this infinite vector? It turns out that it's uncountable. Okay. Um, does anybody know the argument? Other than Max? <laughs> who, can, who can give the argument? The argument is by, by contradiction. Right? You say, suppose. Suppose you know that um, uh, A is is countable, right? Right. In that case, um, the elements of A can be made into a list, right? Sequence one, sequence two, sequence three, 
et cetera, et cetera. Right? There's going to be some countable list of, of elements. Right? A can be made into a non-repeating list. Yeah, all right. You're saying that A is a list of sequences? That's right. So each of these things is a sequence, mm -hmm. right? Um, like each of these things looks like this, right? It's some um, infinite sequence of zeros and ones. Okay. So like like S one is um, maybe I should say like A one one, A one two. I'll use A one three, A one four, et cetera, et cetera. S two is A two one, A two two, A two three, et cetera, et cetera. S three. Okay, so each one is each one is one of these infinite infinite, infinite vectors. Now. Okay, so A can be put into a list like this. Um, okay, you say okay, and these are all um, these are all possible elements. Okay. So all of them are here. Okay, um, you say okay. Uh, now create a new sequence. <coughs> S star. Okay. Create a new sequence S star by um, as follows. Okay. Let um, uh, let's let's call it um, let's call it uh, uh, let's get notation x one x two x three blah blah blah. And what we're going to do is say um, we're going to create a, create the new sequence by looking at um, the diagonal elements. Okay, three, three, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So we look at the di diagonal elements, right? We say, oh, what's what is this? Maybe it's a zero. Okay. In that case, we let x one be one. Okay. What's this thing? If it's a one, we if it's a zero, we let x two be one. If it's a one, we let x two be zero. We choose the different thing. Okay. So, um, okay. So, uh, create a new sequence by uh, x i is going to be um, uh, it'll be one if a i i is zero. It'll be zero if a i i is one. So if my right if I if in my list I had something like this, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, say 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, blah, 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 then my the thing that I'm gonna make is gonna start off 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. Okay. So it's gonna it's gonna it's going to differ from the first one in the first element. It's going to differ from the second sequence in the second element, and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, okay. Then S star cannot be any of the S S sub i, right? Because it it differs from S i in its I element. Yeah, fair. Is this the argument given for um, the cardinality of the power set of a combo set being uncombable? Yes, yes. Um, yeah. It's the same argument. Okay, so is that all right? Right. So you say, okay. Suppose you have a set. Um, suppose, suppose this set of infinite sequences is countable. In that case, put them put them into a list. Right. So this should be all all possible sequences, <coughs> and then we create a sequence. But this sequence differs from each one of them. Right. So it's not it's not on the list. Right. So S star is not on the list. Right? 
but that's a contradiction because we are supposed to have all the all the sequences, right? This was supposed to be a was the set of all infinite sequences, blah blah blah. Well, and we if it's countable, we can put them on a list. But here we found some guy who's not on that list. Okay, so contradiction. Okay, so the set um, thus right, a is not countable. Thus a is not countable. Okay, and um, the corollary is that R is also not, is not countable, right? Because you can express R um, using infinite sequences of ones and zeros as a binary, using binary, uh, binary notation. Like you ex express the numbers between zero and one uh, for R, right? A, a is equivalent to this, the, the interval zero one. Yes, like. Um, professor, so how do we know that we can ensure basically we can like create a new set and not have any of those in the um, in the ones that are already existing? Like how if we I know we've defined it like that, but I mean because we cannot see what all sets exist. How do we know that we're always preventing, our, preventing ourselves from being one of the? Well, so you say, you say, um, suppose A is countable, yeah. right? In other words, the, the set of all infinite sequences of zeros and ones is countable. Make them into a list, right? Make them into a list. Here they are, right? And then you create the sequence by by you know basically inverting each of these each of these terms. If it's zero, turn it into one. If it's one, turn it into zero. Right? And so that new guy is not any one of these, not any one of these elements, right? It's not the 10 billionth element because it differs from it in the 10, 10 billionth entry. It's not the 77th entry because it's not the 77th element because it differs from it in the 77th entry, and so on and so forth. Right? So you know, I mean, you know that this guy is not any one of those. Okay. That's that's the main point. Right? It's not any one of those, so it's not on the list, and that's a contradiction. Does that make sense? Or yeah, does but, that yeah, that makes sense. But what if in the likelihood that, for example, 77th element, we inverted it? Mm -hmm. And can there not be a case where the result is one of the other ones? So if we invert the 77th element, we create this new set. But what if that new set is already one of the other ones? Mm, it, I mean, it's... Uh, it it can't have been it can't have been one of the previous ones, right? Because it can't have been one of the previous ones because um, uh, you already created your, your sequence to disagree with the previous ones at the at the ith term, mm -hmm. right? And you continue on and make sure that it, it disagrees with everybody that follows, right? So you're not gonna you're not going you're not gonna end up you're not gonna um, you can't it's impossible that cannot occur. Are you? I think I missed something in the corollary. I know in the book it talked about like how R can be represented in binary. Yeah, yeah. Um, but here you're saying that A is equivalent mm -hmm. to the interval zero one. Yeah. Yeah. So if you look at um, the numbers between zero and one, you can express them in in binary notation, right? Just like decimal notation. Okay. And so you have this um, A and and this are um, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between them, mm -hmm. basically. It's a, it's not quite true, but it's close enough, mm -hmm. um, right? But this is this is uncountable, and so this is also not true. <coughs> okay. Okay. Is everybody all right? Everybody all right? Okay. Um, <laughs> So let's go on. Um, so you know, this course uh, is called Principles of Real Analysis. I've always fought against that title, but never succeeded in changing it. Um, uh, really, this should be a course called just Principles of Mathematical Analysis, like the title, because 
we're actually going to leave the real numbers. Um, we do not, we're not always working with the real numbers. Um, in fact, what we work in is something called a metric space. Okay. Okay. Metric space is, I mean, it's true that the that Euclidean space is a, is a metric space, right? R, R, Rn is a metric space. Uh, you know, Cn is a metric space, but we, but we're going to deal with metric, metric spaces in general. Okay. But you can think of it, I mean, it's, it's probably useful to keep in mind, it's a generalization of Euclidean space. Okay, okay. so um, uh, you have a set. You have a set, and you have some function defined on x cross x. This thing is going to be called our metric. Uh, we use the letter D because it's like the sense of it's like something like distance. Okay. Okay. So you have this function, a function such that um, uh, such that for all p and q in X, um, uh, the distance between two points is greater than zero whenever is not equal to Q and uh, the distance between the point and itself always equals zero. Um, B, the distance from one point from P to Q is the same thing as the distance from, from Q to P. Right? And C, the distance from P to Q is less than or equal to the distance from P to R plus the distance from R to Q. In that case, in that case, we call uh, uh, the set x comma d uh, metric space, and d a metric. Okay. Again, this this d you want to think of as a distance. So D, you know, all it's saying here is that between any two points, you have a positive distance, right? Between a point and itself, the distance is zero. That's sort of what you would, what you think of a distance, you know, distance ought to behave like that, right? Same thing, you know, the distance from me to, to Eric is the same as the distance from Eric to me, right? That's, that's also what you want. What about this third one? The distance from P to Q is less than or equal to the distance from P to R plus distance from R to Q. What is that in your normal, normal? Uh, triangle inequality, right? So this third one is, you want your metric to satisfy a triangle inequality, right? Okay, and if it does these three things, then we call it a metric space. Okay. Okay. Um, so, uh, you, yeah, you, 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 some metric spaces you've seen before, um, you know, you've seen, you know, like in R2, right? You've got two points, x, y, uh, the distance, of course, the distance between x, y, and uh, a, b is um, the square root of x minus a squared plus y minus b squared, right? So this is R2 with the standard Euclidean, Euclidean metric, right? Um, does anybody know a more peculiar, uh, any, any other cases of metric spaces? Any other examples of metric spaces? Here's a funny one. Um, uh, so when you have two points in space, uh, so you have R2, but you put a different metric on it called the taxicab metric. Okay. You probably heard of this one, right? You, so the taxicab metric, you add this distance plus this distance, right? Right. So instead of taking um, x minus a squared plus x minus b squared, you take um, X, x minus a, absolute value plus y minus b, right? So that's, the, that's your new distance. Uh, 
the distance between x, y, and a, b, and the taxicab metric. And it turns out that, um, that this metric also satisfies in the three properties. I mean, if you want to do that as an exercise, go ahead. Okay, so that's an example of, of, of another metric. Um, okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Um, let's do this. Some basic uh, definitions. Basic definitions. You have a metric space. Okay. So keeping in mind, you know, either R with the Euclidean metric or R with the taxicab metric, whatever you like. Um, so uh, suppose if you have a point in the space and you have some real number um, R, some real number, we let uh, we let n sub R p denote the set of Q in the space such that the distance from uh, uh, P to Q is less than R. Okay, and this is called, um, called a neighborhood, a neighborhood of P of radius R. Neighborhood of P of radius R. <coughs> okay. Okay. So, right. So if we're in Euclidean space, what does this look like, right? You have some, you have some point P and you have some radius R. Well, that's just gonna be the, the open, open disk, right? Or open ball in R, R2 or Rn, right? So this is your, this, this set here is your N RP. Um, what if we are in, in the taxicab metric? What is a, what does a neighborhood look like? It is P. It is P, and let's say that this distance is R. What is the what does the neighborhood look like? Like the longest thing around. Yeah, it'll look like. Um, well, you can go. Right, it'll be like this, right? Maybe it'll be a diamond around the. Right, because you can go, you could go all the way up R this way. You're, you're in your taxi, you're allowed to drive R distance, right? So I'm gonna drive this far and then this up, right? Or, you know, halfway there and halfway up, right? right? So it'll be a, it'll be a, a square, right? The, the interior of that square, right? Because we're not allowed to reach the edges, so I should make dotted, dotted edges here. So this is a this is a uh, this is a neighborhood. Okay. Everybody okay? It's just a just a, like all points of distance less than r from from the center. Okay. okay. Let me introduce. So this isn't in your book, but it's sort of a useful notation. Um, if I write n r p star, what I mean by that is the neighborhood, but you throw out the, the center of it. Okay. The neighborhood, but without with the center removed. Okay. And I'm going to call this a punctured neighborhood. Punctured neighborhood of of p of radius. Definition number two, um, uh, again, your point is in X. If every 
Um, if every punctured neighborhood of P um, contains, I'm sorry, so let me, let me start. So um, suppose you have a set in your space. Okay. You have a set in your space. Suppose maybe who's please what you keep in mind. You have some set. You have some set in space, and um, you have some point P also in the space. Okay. Um, if every punctured neighborhood, every every punctured neighborhood um, of P uh, uh, intersects P, then we say. P is a limit point of E. <coughs> Every punctured neighborhood of P intersects E. Right? If you want to write it a little bit differently, I'm saying that if for all radii, the intersection of, of the punctured neighborhood and E is not empty, then we say it's a limit point of E. Yeah, Why can't you just use the regular neighborhood instead of the punctured neighborhood? Well, um, in that case, suppose you have, you, you'll, you'll see why in a second. I'll explain in a second. Okay. okay. So, um, Let's suppose that, let me, sh let me show you what I mean. Suppose this is your set, suppose you're in Euclidean space, and this is your set, right, an open ball, open disk, okay? Then is this guy, is this guy a limit point? Well, to be a limit point, every punctured neighborhood should intersect E, right? Every punctured neighborhood. Well, there may be some punctured neighborhoods that intersect E, but you can find somebody that does not. Okay, so this is not a limit point. Okay. Is suppose I take a point inside inside here, right? Is that a, is that a limit point? Yes. yes, right? Because you know every every punctured neighborhood is going to intersect you. Okay. Suppose I take an a, a a point on the boundary here. Is that a limit point? Yes. Yes, right? Because again, every punctured neighborhood I throw out throw out this guy, and I look at all the punctured neighborhoods. Well, every punctured neighborhood is still going to intersect that set. Okay. So that guy is called a limit point. Uh, How is that different from just saying that P is within E? Uh, well, this point is not in E. Okay. Right? This guy, so here we've got it set. If we take this point on the boundary of E, which isn't, isn't in E, that guy is a limit point, but it's not in E. Okay. okay. Now, um, okay. Uh, Suppose E consists of a single point. So let's go to a different example. Suppose E consists of a single point here. Okay. Um, does it have any limit points? It's single point itself. It, so E is just E is just this this one point P. Okay. Does it have any limit points? Well, to be a limit point. Every punctured neighborhood must intersect E, right? Well, suppose I take this guy. Well, no, this punctured neighborhood doesn't intersect E. Well, suppose I take P itself. Well, every punctured neighborhood must intersect E. Well, the punctured neighborhood doesn't intersect E. This answers your question marks, right? If we didn't say punctured, in that case, this would be a limit point, right? Because it would intersect the set. So you can't, you don't want to, you don't want to do that. But professor, yes. So in that small circle that you've drawn in the above example, that is, there is some area that is outside. So below that, yeah. So there is some area that is outside. Yes. E. Yes. How are those points? Those points are not inside E. So how is that? That's right. But all we want, all we care is that you know, punctured that there is some intersection, not that the whole thing intersects. That's that's a different notion. So the way you want to think of this is that you can get, you know, your your point is arbitrarily close to E, right? Your point is 
you know, there are, you know, no matter how small a distance you choose, there's somebody, somebody else nearby who is in E. Yeah, Arnie. Sorry, the conclusion from the very bottom was that if E is the, if, if E is a point. If E is a single point, a singleton plane, mm -hmm. then, then there is no, there are no other points. Okay. Um, number three, if P is an E, but P is not a limit point of E, um, then we say we call P an isolated point. Of e. We call it P an isolated point. Because that means that this point is in the set, but there's some punctured neighborhood that doesn't intersect E, right? That there's some distance where this guy has no nobody in E in his neighborhood, right? He's a loner, right? There's nobody nobody from E in that punctured neighborhood. But Professor, if yeah. E is in E, wouldn't we always have at least some points of intersection with E? Uh, so, I mean. P is in E, but if we're asking whether it's a limit point or not, we look at the puncture neighborhood, right? We, 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 don't, we, don't, we don't pay attention to it. So you say, um, for him to be not a limit point means that there's some punctured neighborhood where there's nobody else in there. Would there be at least some points that would be in E? P itself is in E. But not the area around it. Okay, so let's. So this is just. Okay, so this is just. Uh, you know, let's 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 think of what this definition means. Okay, P is an E, but P is not a limit point. Okay, what does it mean to be not a limit point? To be a limit point, to be a limit point means that whatever whatever punctured neighborhood you choose, uh, there's somebody else in there who's of your same your same set. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you're not a limit point, that means that. Uh, there is, there is some puncture neighborhood that fails that, right? So there's some puncture neighborhood that um, where there's nobody, there's some puncture neighborhood where there's nobody from your set in there, okay? So there's gonna be some radius where there's nobody, none of your friends are here, okay? You've gone to college, <laughs> right? There's nobody that you know within a 100 mile radius. So it's isolated. Okay, okay, uh, okay. Let me just get a couple of these in. I know I'm running a little late. Sorry. Okay, so number four. Um, uh, if every limit point of E is in E, we say E is closed. We say E is closed. Okay, um, so in that example of the open open disk, right? Well, the limit points are all these guys, right? The guys on the boundary, right? I guess the guys inside as well. But so this guy is not closed because there are limit points, and it doesn't contain those limit points, right? But if we chose the disk including its boundary, well, that's going to be that's closed, okay? Because it has all its limit points. It contains all its limit points. Okay. Let me just do one more, one more uh, uh, term. So um, uh, five. If um, if there exists a neighborhood, if there exists a radius such that the whole neighborhood of P is contained in E. Then we say um, P is an interior point. Okay. An interior point of E. Okay, so again, let's go to this, this open disk here. 
right? This guy here, there is a radius, there is some radius that this neighborhood lies inside of E, right? So this guy, this point is interior, right? This guy's interior, right? This guy, also interior, right? I can find some radius where the whole, whole disk lies inside of the set. This guy's not interior, right? <laughs> right? This guy is also not interior, right? Because I can't find a radius that works. Right? No matter how small a radius I choose, I'm just not, I can't find a, a neighborhood that's entirely contained inside the set, right? So it's not interior to the set. Okay. Yes, Susan? To me, <coughs> it seems that for any E that is not, that is not closed, the interior points of E is the same as the limit in the limit points. Is that correct? Uh, any E that is, I'll have to think about it, sorry. Um, yeah. It's not so straightforward. I don't, I don't think so, but I have to think about it. So. Okay, okay, sorry to keep you up. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll finish up these definitions next week.